I'm of that age that still thinks the 80s were 30 years ago and that the 90s just sort of happened. Strange as that logic is, there's nothing like movie anniversaries to pull me back into reality. Last episode, we looked at In the Mouth of Madness and its impact now going strong 30 years later. That flick though, like most of Carpenter's catalog, was something that was already out whenever I started my movie journey. I had already seen it on VHS and on TV from time to time, which puts it in another category altogether. Move ahead just five short years to 1999, one of the greatest years in cinema history, and we start getting that nice 25 years of existence that puts that nice existential crisis right into my gut. Today, we're gonna look at one of those movies that probably isn't considered a traditional horror movie, but is absolutely horrific in nature. Does 8mm starring Nick Cage stand the test of time, or should it be burned like the evidence in the movie? I always forgot that this is a Joel Schumacher movie. When I think of him, it's hard not to think of bright comic book neons and bat nipples on suits, but his career was a very interesting one that had just shy of 40 projects. If you don't think of the late 90s Batman movies, then you probably associate him most with The Lost Boys, as it is a quintessential 80s horror and one of the best vampire flicks of all time. For horror, he also had Flatliners, The Number 23, and Blood Creek to pair with today's flick. He was central in the making of this movie, in fact, and it may not have happened if he hadn't signed on. Sony and Columbia were the production and distribution companies on the project, and originally it was a much smaller handheld affair with Russell Crowe set to star. Before that, though, they had felt it was one of the riskiest scripts they had ever purchased and were honestly not sure it was going to be made. Schumacher, who had felt disappointment and a kind of emotional void with cinema, heard about it, and even though he was told it could be career suicide, he eagerly signed on to do something different. Russell Crowe did not quite have the star power or multiple Oscar wins here, and when Nick Cage was interested in the title, it became a bigger budgeted affair and a very different movie. Part of this was due to the changes of the script originally written by Andrew Kevin Walker. Walker is a heavy hitter as well. He started with Brain Scan in 94, but the following year gave us seven for David Fincher. Unfortunately, the script was altered going into production by Schumacher and Nicholas Kazan, which caused Walker to disown the movie and not even visit the set during production. The story follows Nick Cage's private investigator, Tom Wells, who was contacted by a wealthy widow named Christian who found a disturbing 8mm film in her husband's belongings. Her lawyer, Longdale, sends him on the hunt to prove that the film isn't a real snuff film, and it leads him to Los Angeles and New York into the seedy world of violent and fetishistic pornography. He befriends a knowledgeable store clerk named Max California, who then leads him to Eddie Poole and Deanie Velvet, who find talent and make the movies. They also run into Machine, who has a signature tattoo on his hand and shows up in many of the movies. When the filmmakers find out that Wells is an investigator, they make him burn the movies before killing Max and attempting to kill him. Wells gets them into a fight amongst themselves over money, with Longdale and Velvet killing each other. Wells escapes and tells the widow Christian it was all true and the movie was real. She ends her own life, but sets up payments to both Tom and the victim's family. But Tom sets out for vengeance. He kills both Poole and the machine, who turns out to be just a really messed up regular dude. He heads back home to pick up the pieces of his life and try to move on from the experience. The movie received mostly poor reviews, but did make a profit with $97 million on its $40 million budget. As sort of a neo-noir, the movie attempts a gritty realism that could pass for the 70s, but being in 1999, it has some call-outs. While Tom does use an early cell phone, like, you know, the one where you pull the antenna up to use it kind of old, they mostly use landlines and payphones. How Tom Wells investigates shows its age a tad too. He doesn't use the internet to investigate or research and rather goes into buildings and calls or interviews people in person. He tracks down people by studying the movies and gets help from people that can lead him to others who are involved. The snuff film angle itself is also a forbidden object during that time of underground pornography in the 90s, especially with the tail end of VHS and the boom of DVDs beginning where the products could be sold or traded without much trafficking or responsibility. The movie has its genesis in two specific movies, Hardcore and Snuff. Snuff is the 1975 video Nasty that was banned in multiple countries and was thought by some to be the real deal. Hardcore is the soul-crushing Paul Schrader film that follows a similar story with the father trying to track down his daughter. The technical side of the film has its own sign of the times too, as the color grading and filming style fit in with everything that Michael Bay was doing at the time, as well as damn near every other action horror or drama director of the time who felt they had a pizzazz going that would capture the cultural zeitgeist. This extends to the camera angles and music used for the movie that fits right in with everything else happening from the mid to late 90s. 
For a modern comparison, it's very similar to the lens flares that get made fun of in the most recent decade of filming. You could probably guess the year within a two year window just by watching parts of the movie. Finally, it's impossible to talk about the 90s without discussing Nicolas Cage's star power, particularly most in his Oscar win for Leaving Las Vegas. The next year would give us The Rock, followed by Con Air and Face Off in 1997, Snake Eyes the next year, and then 8mm was paired with Bringing Out the Dead in 1999. Look at the directors and actors he worked with. His star power was something else at the time. The movie falls under the unfortunate flag of both What If and The Sum being less than its parts. What holds up though? The movie is a mean and gritty one, with 75% of the humans we see not exactly being good, reputable people. It's a mean movie with a mean story that unfortunately could have been angrier, and we sadly will never see that. It does have some wonderful performances from a young Joaquin Phoenix, a reliably slimy Peter Stormare, also slimy Anthony Held, Chris Bauer, and a true romance level creep performance from the late great James Gandolfini. The scene where they confront Cage and kill Phoenix before infighting with each other shows off how great all these guys are, and we're lucky to get them all in the same place. This also leads to great lines like, This is a long day, if there's no honor among perverts and pornographers, the whole fucking business will fall apart. The actual titular 8mm snuff film is also unsettling as hell and sold to perfection by anyone that watches it. For the problems I have with Cage, I think his intensity and disgust from the moment he watches the film to the end, when he needs the catharsis of revenge, is done really well. Unfortunately... The rest of Cage's performance is very lackluster. He doesn't have the crazy outbursts we're accustomed to seeing, and he's just never fully unhinged like he is in most of the other movies he made during that five year stretch we mentioned earlier. I hate to say it, but I think we missed out on a superior film here with Russell Crowe operating with some version of the original script and idea. I like Nick Cage. I like his crazy unhinged performances. I like when he puts everything he has into his straight man dramatic roles. I love him in every genre he has shown up in, but he just doesn't have it here and it hurts the movie. He isn't a bit part or a secondary character. He is the avatar for the audience and the one that guides our attention for two hours and three minutes. The movie has really great aspects to it, but it's also a little bit too long and a little bit too slow at points when the jolt it needs to push it over the edge just isn't there. 8mm is sadly a case of what could have been versus what we have. The movie it takes its inspirations from are far better experiences and the parts just don't add up together to make the best sum. While many of the performances are great, the lead actor weighs the production down with a mostly sleepy portrayal. The story itself is good, but was neutered down to lose some of its edge. While Scream Factory did what they always do and gave fans and collectors a worthy physical copy, the movie is destined to be mostly discussed in smaller circles and falls short of the potential it once had. It had been over 20 years since I saw the movie, and while I remembered the most interesting parts, the rest I had forgotten about, just like I did shortly after rewatching it for this episode. 8mm is a slow and ultimately frustrating watch, as the movie we could have had stays tantalizingly out of our grasp, while what we ended up with sadly doesn't stand the test of time. Thank you.